Hello everyone and welcome to our AGU AGI Heads and Chairs webinars discussion this month. My name is Lila Gonzalez and joining me today will be Pranoti Asher, who's the Assistant Director of Grants and Education Programs at AGU. And she's also AGI's Scholar in Residence. And Christopher Keene is also on the line. He's the Director of Geoscience Profession and Higher Education here at AGI. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Pranoti to introduce our speakers for today's discussion. All right. Thank you, Leela. Welcome, everybody. I am so pleased that everyone can join us this afternoon to hear a lot about field trips and how to make them accessible and inclusive for everyone, especially for students with disabilities. Our panelists today are Anita Marshall, who is a geology lecturer at the University of Florida in the Department of Geological Sciences, and she is also the Director of Operations for the International Association of Geoscience Diversity, a nonprofit organization that advocates for students and geoscientists with disabilities. Joining Anita is Chris Atchison. He's an associate professor in the School of Education and his specialty is geoscience education. And he's at the University of Cincinnati. He also serves as the executive director of the International Association of Geoscience Diversity. So Anita and Chris, take it away. Thanks for that great introduction. My name is Anita Marshall and joining me today is Chris Atchison. We co-run the International Association for Geoscience Diversity. Thank you for the big turnout today. We're really happy to see so many uh, people interested in uh, this this topic. I'll, I'll turn over to Chris for a, a brief introduction and we'll get going. Hey everybody, this is Chris Atchison. Thank you for joining us. Um, a few uh, points that I wanted to make before we get started. Um, we're going to cover a little bit of information that, that discusses how we can best be supporting all of our students in field courses, understanding that there's really no way that we can cover all this in one hour. We will provide a few resources at the end. We'll take some time to go through those as well as our contact information. Please reach out to us if you have specific questions regarding your courses in your department understanding that everybody has different and very unique situations and scenarios. So uh, we're here to help you, um, but today we're going to go through some very general things that you should consider when you're planning your field trips. Um, understanding the summer field trips right now are, are uh, a little bit in flux, a little bit more than a little bit, but um, one thing I also wanted to talk about too is as an organization, the IEGD has been hearing from several members uh, in our community um, about the overall accessibility of not just our courses, but our meetings. Um, and we want to make sure that we acknowledge the fact that whenever you have meetings, whether they be conferences, uh, online webinars such as this, that accessibility is overly important and you should always consider the accessibility of your of, of your audience and not just the needs as you recognize them. Um, and I will let Anita kind of follow up on that message. Yes, yeah, so in fact, this webinar was originally um, broadcast out, promoted with without accessibility information in place, which was pointed out to us by one of our members. And so even those of us who work in this area can slip up every now and then. Um, but we were very happy that uh, AGI and uh, AGU were very proactive about um, our concerns and we're able to post that information and get those accessibility issues cleared up very quickly. So we're, we're really happy about that. So before we get into the specifics, it's important to recognize that traditional field culture, and by that I mean sort of the hiking boots and rock hammer um, type of field geology, is by its very nature exclusive. That's not to bash field work. In fact, field work is a really important component of a geologist's education and training. Uh, but the culture surrounding field work and the value that we put on physical ability in the field can be very exclusive and very marginalizing for people who may not be able to keep up in a traditional uh, field setting. 
So um, it's it's important to think about field work as not just an exciting outing, but the educational outcomes that that we're expecting from our students and and separate the physical aspects of it from the educational aspects of it when we're looking at how to be inclusive. Um, so one of the other things about field culture is that it marginalizes people with disabilities both in and out of the field. So it's easy to think about how um, a, a challenging hike for somebody with physical limitations is going to be marginalizing, but outside of the field, it carries a big impact as well. I think many people don't realize what, what an influence our field experiences have on our careers. Many times we meet as students, uh, we met our future advisors or our letter writers or people who invited us on further research trips based on our performance in the field in those networks that we grew. We bonded with future colleagues and we made those strong identities as part of the geoscience community many times in the field. So when we exclude people with disabilities from those field activities, um, it impacts not just their ability to participate in field geology, but it also um, impacts their ability to succeed as geologists. So um, that's important to keep in mind as well. Chris, do you have anything to add on this slide? Uh, no, I think you covered it just fine. Thank you, Anita. Okay. <clears throat> I think that I'll, I'll, I'll go into uh, continuing to think about what uh, what we're up against here in terms of accessibility. Oftentimes I get people asking me, um, you know, how, why are we working so hard to support so few students? And so early on, I didn't have a response for that. Now, um, what the, the problem that we're dealing with, it's, it, it's, it's not a problem. I don't want you to all think that this is a problem, but I want us all to understand that in any given context or class that there are as there, there, there are as many as 20 to 25 percent of your student population that has a disability of some kind. Just because you don't see it doesn't mean it's not there. And so I need us to realize too that that when we're dealing with accessibility, we're dealing with a lot of non-apparent disabilities. And so how do we support that? Well, we'll talk about that in a minute. But before we get into that, a lot of the biggest concern that, that we hear and that we're asked the question is how do we know? Are we allowed to ask our students? And so the short answer to that is, no, not really. And because of that is that they're protected. Disability status is protected by HIPAA. Just like uh, our education records and everything are, are protected. So is disability and health information of our students. But that does not mean that you cannot address the issue and ask for your students to offer up information that's going to help you protect them. Right, so we all know that there are legal and ethical and safety considerations that uh, a lot of our departments, a lot of our colleges are uh, making sure that we are constantly aware of, often to the point of um, trying to get a lot of, uh, of, of the more historical field trips and field camps um, to go away because of this large legal and ethical and um, safety and you know liability and all the above, right? But from the other side of things too, we want to still continue to protect our students. We want to protect their privacy, protect from discrimination uh, from their peers, from faculty, um, and actually when you point out differences or needs or accommodation needs that you're also pointing out otherness, um, which has a major impact on students' sense of belonging. Um, and that in itself comes with a lot of other issues that we do not want to make sure we're, we're bringing up. So I want you to think about this, right? How do we ask our students if they need support? 
Well, when I was thinking about this, uh, a really good example might be if you're out on a field trip and you are getting ready to go to dinner and you're trying to identify a place to go to dinner with your with your class with your course. And one question you might ask your students is, does anyone have any food allergies? And so if you don't feel if, if, if it's OK to ask your students if there are any food allergies. Then I want you to consider that as an accommodation. Because you're not going to go to you might not go to an Italian restaurant for a student that has gluten sensitivities. So you're supporting your student by getting to know them in that capacity. In the same sense, when you're talking about disability, it might be that the way you promote your field courses is helping your students come forward and identifying areas that they meet and that they may need extra help in. That's not to say that they're going to. So understand that you cannot force your students to tell you exactly what they need and what they cannot do. But the more information you provide to them. Provides a more trusting and open and honest and transparent environment for students to share with you. I want us all to realize too that none of us should be making decisions for our students without the students voices being included in that decision making process. If you are not a wheelchair user, then don't make assumptions that you know what it's like to be a wheelchair user. Make sure that you are discussing activities, routines, expectations, learning objectives, all the above with your students before you go in the field so that you can address any issues and develop contingency plannings in collaboration with your students before you actually get there. And so I will say that if, if you have any questions about any of this, make sure you use the chat window and we can we can address those questions. Yes, and I'll, I'll add uh, to build on what Chris said, trust is uh, really one of the main factors here. I have the perspective of having gone through my PhD as a student with a disability and now being an instructor with a physical disability. So I have this interesting perspective from both sides of this issue. And as a student, before I was willing to trust a professor with disclosing my physical disability, they had to build a relationship of trust. I had to feel like I could trust them with the information I was going to give them and that they had my best interests at heart and that I wouldn't be, you know, kicked off the field trip or discriminated against in other ways because I was less physically able than my classmates. So building that relationship of trust is absolutely critical and that has to start well before the field trip itself. And so consider the, the culture, you know, the, the, your departmental culture, your your field experience culture uh, when you're when you're doing this. If, if you're promoting these experiences to be physically rigorous and, and, and oftentimes more a rite of passage than an authentic learning experience, then you might be marginalizing students who um, who, who physically can't do it, who have other barriers that prevent them from doing that. So understanding this, I want us to consider these things. How are you promoting your, your field experiences? How do you go about doing this? Think about the images that you're sharing, videos that you might be putting up in the department hallways, flyers, descriptions. What does your website look like? Is it inviting only the ones that are able to be physically adventurous? What's the diversity look like? So I want you to think about those things as we continue talking about this. Who are you ultimately targeting or excluding in the way that you promote the trip or your courses? 
it's kind of often hard to think about or to, to consider this in the moment. But look at the images that you share through your website and decide what's missing. All right, Anita, you want to go to the next one? Sure. So think about it, the information, just like we shared before, how you promote your field trip is, in, is incredibly important. And information is key to inclusion. This has been talked about in the literature. A lack of specific information is one main reason that students with disabilities choose not to attend field courses and often self-select out of field-focused science disciplines. So be prepared. Be prepared to answer the questions. And again, if you are unsure of how you would answer these questions, please reach out to us. But think about the basic accessibility needs of your students. On residential trips, think about lodging details. Are there accessibility options in where you're staying? If, if you only go into the field to camp, consider that camping is very inaccessible for a lot of people. So if you are going to a campground, are there accessibility, is, are there, is there accessibility lodging nearby? Oftentimes, um, if you promote that there are accessible options, then you might realize that there are other students that are, are more interested in the courses. Think about the terrain. Think about the physical expectations of your field trip. Is this gonna be a limiting factor? Is everything that you're trying to cover in your field course at the top of a mountain or in a deep ravine or over an inaccessible bog? Consider those basic accessibility needs. But then also think about your daily routine. Hours in the field per day. How long are you going to spend in the field? How hot's it going to be? You know, everybody, and I'm sure everybody on the call right now provides um, a, a packing list that students need to think about or need to bring sunscreens and hats and sunglasses and water bottles and all that thing but also think about the details, that students need more details than just what they are packing. How long are they gonna be in the field each day? Are there bathrooms or uh, restroom facilities nearby? Are you gonna be planning specific breaks? What about food? Interestingly enough, when I work with students with autism spectrum disorders, they teach me how to plan and articulate that plan to the rest of the students because it's something that they need. They need that structure. They need it built in so that they understand what they're focusing on at any given time. And as I'm sitting here learning from these students, uh, who have taught me so much about accessibility, I realize that this is something that every student needs. Every student can use a daily routine. This is how long we're going to be in the field. These are our objectives. This is what I, I want you to cover. Uh, this is when you should probably stop to eat lunch because oftentimes students uh, have a, a hard time focusing on one thing over the other. And if they're not told to sit and eat, then lunch doesn't get eaten. Believe it, it happens. Anita? Yeah, I think I think you've you've hit all the all the good points there. So that kind of uh, segues into behavior during the trip. So we've talked about providing information ahead of time, but how you talk about accessibility and uh, inclusion of students with disabilities is every bit as important. So what we mean by that is that students are always looking to faculty and staff to set the tone uh, in terms of social dynamics, um, work ethic, um, pretty much any aspect of going into the field. But many times we can be inadvertently excluding students who have a disability or making them feel very uncomfortable in the situations. Um, there, there are all kinds of examples I could uh, give 
for this. We had uh, on a, a one of our recent trips. I'll I'll talk about one of our recent trips. We were at um, a national park, which have many fantastic accessible trail options, and we were about to split up into different working groups and. It was explained to the students that the accessible route was off in one direction and then the interesting, adventurous, cool route was off in the other direction. <laughs> and, um, you know, it was, it's just little things like that that, you know, the students noticed and they, they definitely brought it up. It's like, well, why is the accessible route not a cool or interesting route? And those types of those little things just remind students with disabilities that they're not part of the the main group socially. You know, when, when you call things out like that, like, you know, we have the accessible route and then the interesting route. So um, just it's just keeping in mind where you're, you're trying to be as inclusive as possible and not singling people out. Um, in a way that makes them feel like they're getting some sort of lesser experience than their colleagues. Chris, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I'll just add that yeah. <clears throat> that was, and I, I want to reiterate that that was one of our trips that mm -hmm. we said that and didn't realize. So don't think that, that you know, we're, we're, we're always learning. You know, I, I'll say something and I realize, oh, or somebody will help me realize that I probably should have considered saying it differently. So a lot of things, even on the trips that we run, that was uh, uh, that was something that we said and we learn from it and we remember those kinds of things moving forward. And I will say as somebody who has been on the receiving end of of some comments sort of in that vein, what makes the biggest difference to me is so an instructor's willingness to uh, take criticism and do better. Um, you know, a lot of times those little comments like that, if they're immediately, you know, addressed or just like, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry, that's not at all what I meant. And they have this good faith effort to do better, then you know, it's no big deal. It's it's when all those little comments just add up and and there's no evidence that somebody's genuinely trying to um, do things um, right by all of their students that it starts building up to be a problem. So we all make mistakes on this. We all fumble some of these things, but really the main thing that your students are looking for is your willingness to to keep trying in this aspect and, and just try to, you know, try to do better in the future. And that's, you know, that's really all we're asking. OK, so thinking about our trips, um, you know, how do we identify what those barriers are? And again, remembering that there's probably a significant population of students in your department who have disabilities that you don't know. They aren't just going to self disclose and tell you because there's a lot of ramifications that there's historically a lot of ramifications that come along with self-disclosing. And so understand that we're dealing with students, a lot of students in each of our departments that need to be supported. And so they need to be supported uh, academically and socially. And, and I'll, I'll talk about each of them here. Academically, um, uh, there's a there's a new paper that is coming out and, and I, I won't talk a whole lot about it because it's not in press yet, but it talks about the differences between accommodations and modifications um, and how uh, that is kind of considered in the, in the focus of field. But I also want us to realize too that accommodations and modifications are for a single student oftentimes. So you might see that a student isn't going to be able to do this. So we're going to take our current activity and we're going to modify it to support the needs of that one student. And so I never really see accommodations and modifications as being overly positive. Because as you as you might imagine, that student is often singled out um, and and the otherness of the learning community is apparent. 
And so how do we overcome that? And if any of you have been on any of our of the IGD accessible field trips, we talk about this a lot. Um, through universal design, if any of you are aware of or familiar with universal design for learning, um, if you're not, I would encourage you to look that up. But there are three guidelines with respect to universal design that we should consider even in the field. It's representation, it's expression, and it's engagement. The representation piece is how you are providing field-based content. The, the, the goal here is to provide that content through multiple ways. And so you might have students going into the field, uh, you might have hand samples available, you might have aerial photography, you might have thin sections available, you might have descriptions. All of this is a representation of the same content. Engagement, you know, you're, you're engaging your students in this content differently. You're not doing the same thing day in and day out, right? You're trying to change it up. Doing so supports more students than you realize. And then the way that students are able to demonstrate that knowledge and understanding of the field back to you, how they're able to uh, collaborate with one another, how they're able to uh, interact with you as an instructor, is that is that area of expression. So you want to change that up. You want your students to be able to demonstrate their understanding of the content back to you in more than one way. And doing so supports all of your students not just singling some students out. Another thing that we often that we really try to do and we really make sure that everybody's aware is when you're teaching in the field, especially at outcrops and everybody's kind of spread out and um, you're only able to 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 yell and 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 you know I, I think back to being on the outcrops you know right next to the road and cars are flying by and it's loud and you're having a hard time listening and understanding and you're not really sure what you're supposed to be paying attention to and what notes you're supposed to be taking and what sketches you're supposed to be making right think about all this cognitive uh, bombardment that students are, are getting and so i would urge you to consider that when you are teaching that you teach the whole group so you have a preliminary discussion that you might go over that daily routine and discuss exactly what the goals and uh, expectations are for a specific site. And make sure your students understand that, look, there are gonna be loud cars going by. So when I have something important to teach, I'm gonna wait until we're all back together again, probably at a quieter location to where everybody can participate in that discussion equally. Right. If you're trying to teach to the whole group across a, 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 an outcrop like this that's loud and a lot of other issues happening, then you're going to be you're, a lot of your students are going to be missing out on that. It might be also that you provide students say, hey, uh, I want you to come. I'm going to be stationed right here and I want to make sure that everybody comes by because there are things that I want to point out to you. Right, so make sure you're very aware of how you're teaching in the field and make sure it's very structured and your students are aware of how you're going to go about doing it. But then make sure that at the end of the day or at the end of the field site before you get back in the vans and go on to the next place that you have that debriefing session. You talk about big ideas. You talk about observations and interpretations that have been made that everybody can hear. You make sure that students are aware, especially at the introductory level, of what they need to write down, sketches that need to be made, and so on. But aside from the academic components, do not underestimate the social interaction. This is what is, you know, think about field courses and camps that you teach or even that you've been on long ago. A lot of the benefit to these field courses is the interaction with your peers. And so if we're accommodating or, modif or modif modifying a single student's needs, which oftentimes probably has them doing something different than the rest of the group, you're taking away that social interaction. So the goal here is that you want to try to get all of your students together, collaborating, 
discussing, sharing observations, making collaborative interpretations together. Build in time for that purposeful, inclusive collaboration. I can't stress that enough. That is where the true learning happens. I'm sorry if you're to, to, to hit some of your egos here, but your students are learning from each other oftentimes more than they're learning from you. So make sure that that is a huge part of your instruction. Also, though, know that you know you you might have social activities built in if it's a residential trip. Um, some social activities are kind of developed uh, through the students themselves and in kind of out of your hands. But if you are planning social activities, make sure those social activities are as inclusive as possible. Encourage your students to consider social activities are inclusive as possible. Um, there are a lot of other implications here that we're not going to get into. A lot of the issues related to alcohol, um, a lot of issues related to harassment, uh, and those are all things that need to be discussed. There's certainly not uh, a piece of what we're going to talk about here, but certainly by no means less important. Anita? Right, and it's, you know, sometimes it's just simple things like, um, you know, when I went to field camp as a student, we would hang out at a bonfire at night, but it was not in an especially accessible location. So if we had had somebody with uh, a significant physical limitation, they would not have been able to join us uh, in in the social activities for the night. So sometimes it's just as simple as looking at where students are hanging out and, and if those areas are accessible or not on a very basic physical level. OK, so let's talk about contingency planning and supporting students needs. So we've given you a lot to think about so far, and I understand that it can be pretty overwhelming to try to think through all the what ifs, but I do want you to think through just a few what ifs and how you would uh, tackle those challenges. So if you've planned field work of any kind, you know that contingency planning has to be part of it. Weather does not always cooperate. Um, gear gets broken when it's shipped sometimes. There are many, many contingencies, lots of things that can go uh, not the way we wanted them to go in the field. The same is true when you're when you're planning these sort of um, educational field trips when you have students with diverse needs. So it's important to think through some of the what ifs. What if not all of the students can get to the outcrop that I had in mind for this activity? Right? What if the weather turns bad and you know, some of the students are not able to participate in extreme cold or in the rain. There are lots of little things like that, that if you think about it ahead of time and you have a plan ready, it makes implementation of a plan, it makes you much more adaptable and flexible in the field to deal with these challenges when they come up. You don't have to think up all of these things on your own. You're not reinventing the wheel here. There are many of us who work in this area of accessibility and uh, we're happy to help you. We have several really great resources that um, I would encourage you to contact us about. The IAGD network is in and of itself a fantastic resource. We have a listserv that goes out to all of our members and people use that to post questions that they haven't been able to find an answer to, or if they're looking for a solution to a particular accessibility challenge. Um, that has been a really great resource for many educators because that listserv goes out not only to other educators who are interested in these topics, but also all of our members with disabilities who can often chime in from a personal perspective and share exactly what has worked for them. So, you know, you don't have to think up all this stuff on your own. We also have some tangible resources that can help you with this. Uh, we are we were recently funded by NSF to get a, a field technology kit together as a lending library. The 
Library of Inclusive Field Tech, or the Lift Kit, as I've been calling it, is um, available to customize for uh, people who have a field course and might have a specific need for accessibility, but don't really have the ability to go out and spend thousands of dollars on technology. If you, if for any of you who've been on our field trips where we get out our um, iPads and wireless um, Wi-Fi hotspots and uh, GoPros and that sort of thing, we have lots of technology that enables live streaming in the field and helps students stay connected from more and less accessible locations throughout a field site. Um, there, we have lots of options for improved accessibility in challenging field situations. So again, we, we encourage you to reach out to us um, and if, you, if you're interested in those sort of things. I would also encourage you to reach out to your local institution if you have a disability services office. That's a great place to start if you need something like a sign language interpreter. Um, sometimes they have equipment that they can loan out as well or they know somebody who does so disability services is always a great start and i always encourage any instructors at a university to go meet the people in the disability services office and get to know them on a first name basis so that when you have these questions it's it's easy to just pick up the phone or shoot an email and um, get some support the other office that is often overlooked is the Education Technology Department. It's called something different at many different schools, but um, basically the people that handle the educational tech on campus, they often have many tools at their disposal when it comes to improving access through technology. So um, those are great people to get to know as well. Find out who to talk to on your campus about accessible vehicles. That's a little different at each campus, but often if there's a, a parking and transit department, the campus buses on most, at least most large universities, they have at least some of their fleet that are wheelchair accessible because they have to by law. And many of those buses are available for other activities if you arrange it ahead of time. This takes a little bit of getting to know people and getting those connections established, but there are options available um, there in terms of accessible transportation. So think creatively about the departments and facilities on campus who might be able to help facilitate some creative solutions to some of your questions. You know, I'll, I'll jump in here as well. <clears throat> Um, contacting your disability support services on campus has is, is been historically a mixed bag. Um, I've heard people that do get support that they need for their students, and I've also heard that sometimes they're not as supportive as they should be. Understanding, too, that a lot of times the disability support offices are very overwhelmed um, and very understaffed. So be patient with them. Um, and also understand that the majority of their um, their purview is to make sure that students are able to access testing and those kinds of things. They're not really thinking all the time about how they're going to support a student on a field trip. So understand that they probably don't have a lot of experience doing such things and they might need you to help them understand what it is you're asking them for. So please do be patient with those folks. Um, and uh, hopefully they'll be able to support you in that. Another thing too, for those of you who have funding and you're running projects and you have students that are uh, participating in some of those projects and, the, and, and those are taking students out into the field. If you, and I'll, I'll point to NSF for specifics, if you have a funded project and on that project, even if it's not in the field, if you are doing lab experiments or anything else that you might have a student with a disability who wants to participate in, consider uh, submitting a supplemental proposal for your existing grant that is there to support the needs of that student. 
If you contact your program officer and discuss that you have a student with a disability, you want to make sure that their needs are met and they're able to participate in your project. Uh, I've not heard of anything, any requests like that ever being turned down. So utilize those supplemental funds. You're able to request up to 20% of your uh, of your NSF award for such things. Utilize that money to support your students, um, especially with accessible vehicle rentals and anything like that. Yeah, if you if you do have questions about that, please reach out. We can help you with that. Yeah, that's an excellent point. And one of the things that I was encouraged to do as a, a grad student with a disability was specifically out. Um, I went out for several of the you know student research uh, grant awards um, from GSA and uh, other organizations like that. And my professors encouraged me to specifically write into the budget money to uh, support me and my disability in the field. Specifically for me, we were asking for an extra person to be in the field to get to the locations that I physically couldn't get to and help with data collection. And uh, there was not a single time where those requests were turned down. Um, so a lot of times it's just a matter of, of asking and, and building that into your, your proposals. Or like Chris says, there's actually times where you can go back and ask for supplemental funds to support people with disabilities participating on your project. Yeah, if you're if you're finding roadblocks, if you have a need like that and you're finding roadblocks, please reach out to us and we can uh, kind of help you um, address that. Um, so a few resources that I want to share with you here today. Um, this is certainly not a whole list of everything that we've put out lately, but a few key ones that we want to make you aware of. Um, the first one here, the accessibility and inclusion in the field paper, that is an actual field guide that was written with accessibility in mind. So this was our accessible field trip at GSA this past year uh, when we left Phoenix. So the field guide starts essentially at the convention center and goes all the way to the Petrified Forest National Park. It talks about the stops that we make. It talks about the accessibility and how accessibility is considered. So I'd encourage you to check that out. The Atchison, Marshall and Collins, that, that just came out uh, in 2019. This was a, a really great paper that, that talks about, um, I'm pretty humble about it if you can't tell. It's a pretty great <laughs> paper. <laughs> uh, it talks about the uh, three different cases that look at developing inclusive communities of learning and how to go about doing that. Um, and so take a look at each of these. I, I won't go through all of them, but each of these talk about how to go about considering inclusion in the field. Uh, the FIG paper 2019 does get into a little bit of the issues with uh, disability support services and how to kind of overcome that. Um, but take a look at this. There, these are some great resources. We can certainly send these out uh, along with others if you do reach out to us. All right. Um, and quickly, uh, with a show of hands, how many of you are canceling your field course? Oh, I'm just kidding. You don't have to put your hands up. Um, most everybody's field courses are either going completely distance learning this summer or uh, being postponed or not running at all. So some of you may have heard that we've created uh, in, a, in association with uh, NAGT that we've created a community that's focusing on designing remote field experiences. Um, so this is something that we got, we kicked off. Our first webinar was on March 23rd and we've been having weekly um, meetings every Monday and a technology demonstration every Thursday. Uh, there's nine different working groups uh, over 200 uh, field faculty coming together from around the world trying to solve the issue of how are we getting, uh, how are we helping our students get access to the field this summer when we're not able to do it in person. So I provide a link there. It is a public link. Uh, we do have a workspace link on the backside. If you are a CERC member uh, that you can access that one um, but check out this one. We've got some of the, the recorded uh, webinars posted on this page. Um, if you want to 
get involved if you're not already involved. If you want to get involved, reach out. If you go to this page, there is a link for how to get involved. Um, but we've got all these working groups coming together to create uh, activities um, and modules that will support students uh, getting field experience this summer uh, remotely. Understanding that there is no way to replicate the field. We're doing the best we can and there's a lot of people coming together to make this happen. It's a pretty amazing thing. So please check that out. If you have more questions about it, uh, reach out and let me know. All right, so we'll wrap this up for now. Uh, just to sort of recap what we've talked about. Traditional field culture is exclusive, but we can change that. Get to know your students, establish a climate of trust and inclusion, ideally before you get to the field experience. How you promote field experiences both in and out of the field matters. Many academic and social barriers to participation can be addressed proactively by thinking of these things ahead of time. And there are resources available to help you make field work more inclusive for all students. Just reach out to us. So we've included our contact information on the screen and uh, we're happy to send that out to the webinar participants as well. You can find the IAGD at the IAGD.org or Accessible Geo on social media. And I've put our email addresses and our social media handles on this page as well. So thank you all for your time and we're happy to field a few questions. Thank you very much. This is a, a great conversation. Uh, this is Christopher Keen. We do have a, a number of questions that came in. Um, one of the folks asks, uh, you know, even though you can't ask do you uh, have any suggestion on how to deal with uh, uh, addressing the increasing issue of mental health especially things like anxiety between students students within nature you know out in the out in the field any of you want to take that or you want me to oh you can do it all right so <clears throat> yeah this is obviously something that's a growing concern and a growing need um, a couple of things that I would do to address that. One, making sure, like we talked about before, that a lot of your information is presented up front. Um, and, and when you do that, especially in your syllabi or any of your descriptions, that you talk about your, your own accessibility, that you are accessible and you're willing, that, that you are um, available for any of these concerns at any time, uh, make sure students feel that they that you're approachable, that you're able to um, reach out to them. If you have TAs, uh, a lot of times students will feel more comfortable talking to the TAs because they're more their age. Um, but again, this is a climate that you, and, and, and you need to make sure that your students know that you take this very, very seriously, that um, that 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 you're willing to address things and, and immediately as they come up. Um, I can't come up with any specific examples right now. I'd, I'd be happy to talk with you and, and talk about a, a few ideas offline. So if you want to reach out to me, please do. But just being completely transparent, open, honest and compassionate is is really how to address this head on. OK, very good. Um, Another question that came in is, uh, uh, I, I agree that trust is very important, but sometimes our field trip leaders aren't the classroom instructors. So how beforehand can you develop the, the trust and absentia, basically? Oh, well, that's an interesting challenge. Um, my first thought would be to find a way to build in some sort of connection between the uh, field course instructors and the students ahead of time, even if it's just, you know, a few like introductory emails or some way where they can start connecting to the students so that the students feel like there's some sort of um, bridge that's been built beforehand. But that's a, that's an interesting question I've never really thought about before. Chris, do you have anything yeah, on that? Yeah, I, I was actually going right where you're going with that, Anita, that, that try to establish that connection early as, as you can and, and make it a personal connection, not necessarily through email, but you know we're using plenty of video conference right now. Um, try to make sure that your students know who this is. Um, 
but also make sure whatever policies you've decided in your class that the instructor is aware of those. So it's a collaborative teaching um, example where you are on the same page, you have the same expectations, you have the same uh, contingency planning and the openness and and, um, and so on, but make sure that you're on the same page and the students are aware of that as well. Okay. Another person asked, uh, do, do you have a, a preferred reference for, uh, regarding universal design? Yep, I would go to CAST, it's C-A-S-T dot org. Okay. And look up universal design. It's a really great website. Excellent. So. Another question, which is interesting, a um, person says, I'm not sure if this is a type of disability or, or driven by cultural preferences, but the issue of hygiene, things like bathroom out in the field, and some of these students are holding it for a very, very long time uh, and other you know, sort of basic function challenges. Uh, any suggestion on how to uh, address those issues or to divine between what may be something, uh, a disability accommodation or maybe something is actually driven more on a cultural or experiential basis? Well, I'll tell you from a the perspective of a female that went to field camp is uh, all of our field camps were run by male instructors. I don't know when they went to the bathroom, but I sure wish they would have built in some sort of plan for that. I. Uh, you know, I had friends that would intentionally dehydrate themselves every day so that they didn't have to go to the bathroom because as a woman, it's a bit harder to find a spot to do that, you know, without being in front of everybody. And as now having a disability, um, I can't, um, let's say, assume the position like I used to, to take care of things in the field. So having some sort of plan for, you know, how in the world I'm supposed to relieve myself in the field, I think has got to be a part of accessibility plan and not just for people with disabilities, but, you know, for everybody. Yeah, it's, it's a really great point that, that it's, it's a part of that, that planning. Um, and in every day when you, when you get started before you leave wherever you're at where there's facilities make sure that your students know what the bathroom plan is for the day I, I think that that is one of the biggest areas where the most anxiety happens um, and so address that head on if you can let them know what the plans are um, if you're out in the middle of nowhere let them know that if people have to go to the bathroom, that where, where the vans are gonna be located, where the keys to the vans are, let them know that they're able to take that van um, or have people meet up and go together. Uh, think about the safety issues there, obviously, but have a plan for this. This is where a lot of anxiety comes. Okay. So another person asked a question saying, you know, they're, they're just gonna, they're entering into the space of, of leading field trips. Um, and they're wondering, is there a, a, a resource with a variety of example plans, as, as you've been discussing, uh, that are that they could access to use as, as, as a template, you know, to try to understand how you address the needs of a few students versus the entire, you know, outcomes and everything? You know, we, we don't. Um, the issue there is that there is no single plan. There's no... Uh, one single way that's going to accommodate every student. Um, I'm happy to talk with you. I'm happy to, to develop a plan with you, uh, but we don't really have a, a single resource where we can point people in the direction of that. It might be that, I mean, I think it's a great idea. It might be that we develop a page on the site that actually talks about suggestions, talks about options, those kinds of things. We don't currently have that. That's um, a great idea. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you do, do either of you have a, a, a preferred reference uh, or resources related to accommodating deaf participants uh, on field field experiences? Yep, we didn't put one up there. Uh, there was a paper by Julie Hendricks. I think it was 2017. I can share that. Um, I can share that out. But um, look up Hendricks 2017. It's about supporting um, students who were uh, deaf and hard of hearing during the 2014 GSA Accessible Field Trip in Vancouver. OK, 
Okay. It was published in uh, JGE, I believe, yes. Okay. I would also say for like practical advice, um, there's a great blog run by deaf academics called The Mind Hears, and they have a lot of really great practical working solutions uh, that you can apply in and out of the classroom to um, work with people who are deaf and hard of hearing. Okay. What do you have any comments about the use of drones for you know developing virtual field trips or actually using them in real time? Uh, you know, you know, in, in improving accessibility, um, you know, or perhaps recording for for later review. Uh, I assume I'm taking this one, Chris. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I do indeed. In fact, it's why I got my remote pilot's license. The drone goes where I can't, and well, if in places we are legally allowed to fly it, but um. Yeah, I think drones are a fantastic option for increased accessibility. One of the things that I find the most compelling about uh, the use of drones is the potential for original data collection. So one of the challenges on a lot of the um, accessible options for fieldwork were say, you know, you're working with somebody who's going out and getting some data in a place you can't get to and bringing it back to you. That's great, and you can still learn a lot from that. But, but to me, one of the best things about doing field work is the ability to collect your own data, right? Form your own hypotheses, collect your own data, process it yourself, like do the whole process. And drones have some really great options for doing that. Everything from, you know, photogrammetry, doing 3D models of a landscape, to flying out to get pictures of an outcrop you can't get to, or you know, even if you've got use of um, a magnetometer that can be drone mounted, you can do geophysical surveys. The, the options there are really fantastic. And many of the drone companies have, de have designed controllers or add-ons to controllers that really have some great enhanced accessibility for people with um, dexterity limitations. So yeah, to me, drones are a really, like, really, really great option. No, that's awesome. Um, so for both of you, what have you found as the most common disabilities uh, that need accommodation? And do they tend to be more physical or cognitive? Chris? So um, I think if you're talking about the general student population, they're going to be certainly not they're not physical physical right. are the ones that you um, are going to be able to see and recognize right away you're, you're dealing with more than non-apparent uh, cognitive disabilities learning disabilities uh, adhd depression anxiety autism is starting to really come up we're just starting to see a lot more students with autism um, so you'll start seeing a lot more resources coming out there's another paper that's getting ready to come out in jge that focuses on students with autism um, so yeah, Anita. Yeah, by by far that's going to be statistically speaking, uh, that's going to be the the bulk of what you encounter. One of the other disabilities that tends to fly under the radar as a hidden disability is um, diabetes, and it can be a real challenge to work out how to do field work as a diabetic, and that's one that. Uh, people can very easily, you know, hide that disability. And um, so, yeah, the the cognitive, emotional disabilities and, you know, most of the disabilities that you'll see in your student population are going to be essentially hidden disabilities, which is why it's important to foster a culture where people feel comfortable, you know, disclosing what they might need to be successful in the field. And I know we're running on time, but we do have one. I'm saving the hardest question for the end for you guys. Um, this is a, a, an undergraduate student who uh, writes that in my department in Patras, Greece, people with disabilities are not allowed. Um, and that needs to change. But how do you think I should start to make that change, particularly as a student? Wow, great question. So not, I assume not allowed to participate. Um, yep. 
uh, you're, you're dealing with a very cultural, a, a huge cultural barrier there that's going to be very overwhelming to overcome. Um, I, I think it's it's about educating your department, educating them on your abilities, educating what you can do, um, getting them to know that you have a perspective that's very unique and innovative and different than everyone else's, um, and encourage them to consider how your perspectives and your abilities can strengthen the community of learning for all of everyone else. Um, and it, again, it's just about educating them. Uh, please reach out if, if you want to talk about strategies and ideas. I'd, I'd be really happy to talk with you. I'll also say as a student, one of the most powerful things you can do is connect with others. Um, the, the biggest thing that the IAGD gave me when I discovered them was a community of other people with disabilities in the geosciences. And it there's something very empowering about finding people that get it and being able to, you know, voice your frustrations and your concerns and, you know, hear what's worked or what hasn't worked for other people in similar situations. So I would also encourage you to, you know, to reach out and connect and, and find that that community of support, which is international. I mean, we're in lots of countries now. So, so yeah, just to follow up on that really quickly, um, if you go to the website, theiagd.org, um, and create a free, you can create a free profile. It costs nothing to be a member of the network. We don't charge for this. So create a free profile. And by doing that, you'll get put on the listserv uh, and access to a lot of people all over. Excellent. So that's all the time we have for questions. Um, I will uh, uh, invite Pranoti or Leela if they have any uh, final comments. Hi, this is uh, Pranoti Asha. Thanks so much, Chris and Anita. This was a phenomenal webinar. There was one question that had come in and had to do with someone wanted an example of an exclusive flyer, one you might have created for one of your field trips. And I'm hoping that you can share that with us so that we can post it on the website when we, uh, you know, put up the recording and the and the slides. So I think that would be a really wonderful resource to share. So again, as was mentioned before, a uh, recording of this um, webinar will become available in, in a few days or maybe a week. And you will certainly be able to share that recording with anyone you think might uh, benefit from watching um, the, the webinar and listening to the conversations. And of course, if you have additional questions and didn't get a chance to write down either Chris's or uh, Anita's emails, please feel free to reach out to me and I'll be happy to forward uh, questions to them. And if you'd like to join uh, future webinars, come to this link and join future webinars and hope to see you next month for the next webinar. So thank you very much again and have a great weekend, everybody.